So now I'd like to welcome our speaker, Ronnie Mackey from Fourth Marine Mammals. And Ronnie's going to tell us about the cetaceans that regularly visit the Fourth and the citizen scientists who monitor them. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Ronnie Mackey. Uh, I live down in Kinghorn, not that far away, but spend quite a bit of time up in the East Newt. I'm going to talk um, about my experiences of uh, uh, marine mammals in the Fourth. Uh, mainly whales, dolphins and porpoises, but we'll put, slip in a few other things as well. Um, the, I think it's very important to say that I am not an expert. I'm a great enthusiast and I've been uh, doing this for quite a long time now. Um, and uh, I've just spent half of my day today watching humpback whales uh, jumping out of the water up uh, Kinghorn Burnt Island. So um, I'm a... Uh, going to tell you a lot about my experiences. Um, I, got, I just got a, a little uh, so story sent to me just a couple of days ago, which kind of throws my timing uh, of the years out, but uh, it was a, a, an interesting little story about a dolphin that used to hang about in the East Nook, well, in Ely um, in particular. It was there for uh, about five years, and it's called Charlie the Dolphin. So I think that's a uh, that actually predates any of the sightings that I ever, ever had. I spent a lot of my time in or on the water um, in Kinghorn and boats and uh, never saw anything really till about 30 years ago. So I'm going to go, go through that, tell you a bit about my background and why I got into a citizen science thing, tell you a bit about fourth marine mammals and uh, how we try and promote, uh, get people to help um, promote um, whales and dolphins and doing a bit for citizen science as well. Um, so we'll just go through that and uh, as I say that if you've got any questions uh, I'm happy to stay around for however long you want me to later on. So the, the first thing is what marine mammals are we seeing in the fourth? Um, we've got three different kinds that we're, uh, we, we kind of classified two of them the cetaceans, which are mainly whales and dolphins and porpoise, um, the pinnipeds, which are our seals that we get here. We've got two kinds of seals here, the grey seals and the harbour seal. And the other one, um, marine mammals, is not a scientific classification. So things that use the marine environment uh, in a, you know, for a large part of their life, uh, you know, things like polar bears, for example, or walrus uh, and some places it's otters. Our otters are not really marine animals, although they do use the, the marine environment, the seashore, but they tend to go off up freshwater areas as well. So these are the kind of things that we're seeing here. Um, as for my background, um, I, uh, I've been involved in citizen science for, for a long time. I saw my first dolphins in the fourth just, I think it was 31 years ago, um, from my house in Kinghorn, I overlooked the water. Uh, in fact, every house I've had in Kinghorn has overlooked the water. Um, and I was able to see a, a large pod of bottlenose dolphins came into the bay at Kinghorn, and I um, got quite excited about that. And I started recording every visit and sending my uh, records of that off to... Um, someone up in St Andrew's direction, whose name I've forgotten now. Um, and I've been involved in it ever since then. I got involved in, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this in, in, a, in a minute or two, but uh, I got involved in um, basking shark surveys. Um, I worked and set up and ran a place called the Ecology Centre in Kinghorn. Uh, I, I have all my sort of personal um, contributions to citizen science, which I'll go through in a minute or two. And I was involved in the setting up of Fourth Marine Mammals, which is, is a Facebook group, but we do quite a lot of interesting things. And out with the Facebook group, we've got a small group that tries to get involved in other projects, which I shall go through um, when we come to each of them. Um, I was uh, lucky enough through my work at the Ecology Centre, I was lucky enough to win a competition a number of years ago and my the prize for the kids that I was working with was uh, uh, about £250 to buy wildflowers for the garden that we were developing in their school and my 
um, prize was a week on a Baskin shark research boat, which was I thought was a bit um, unfair for um, for uh, what I got out of this uh, was immense in comparison to what the kids were getting out of it. Uh, I became very good friends with the skipper of that boat, um, who's written an amazing book on Baskin sharks, uh, and I he invited me back every every summer for a number of years, and we were basically going out on the west coast in a sailing boat and travelling all around the inner and outer Hebrides looking for Baskin sharks. And as we were doing that, I, we obviously saw lots of cetaceans, lots of whales, dolphins, mostly minke whales at that time. Although within 20 minutes of my first trip, we were sitting watching a, a humpback feeding right next to the boat. Um, but I saw white-beaked dolphins and white-sided dolphins, Rissos dolphins, common dolphins and bottlenose dolphins, as well as the, the whales and lots of other things as well, including sunfish and turtles and uh, just some incredible sights out there. So that was a really good introduction for me or to learn about um, marine wildlife as well. Um, I did uh, a lot of things with, with this skipper, uh, including sailing long ways uh, over big oceans at uh, various times. So that was a really, really wonderful introduction for me. I set up and ran the Ecology Centre for a number of years in Kinghorn, which was about taking young people mainly, but not, uh, not exclusively young people, uh, outside and teaching them whatever I could. Uh, I was particularly interested in working with uh, challenging behaviour children and I found that working in the outdoors with them was um, much more beneficial than trying to confine them to classroom teaching. And while we were doing that, we did lots of citizen science there. Uh, we did surveys on butterflies, plants, frogs, toads, everything that we could see, birds, and, and we involved lots of different people. This was a class I was working with uh, uh, latterly in Kirkcaldy, um, out in the woods next to their school. My personal contribution, um, uh, this is my boat that I have uh, out on the west coast. It's not as grand as it looks, it's always needing fixed. And uh, but I go out of Arisaig over on the west coast and that was a result of my Baskin shark trip. The first week that I went out on the Baskin shark trip, I came home and went back, went back to Fife and bought a boat. And the following year, I moved up to Arisaig. So I go out sailing and looking for things. Um, but while I'm out there, I report what I see. So there's a, um, there's a few things here you can see. Sea Watch um, is one of the organisations that I report my sightings to. Uh, Shore Watch is a, is a different one, that's um, Whale and Dolphin Conservation and we have set up, they have, show, they have points all over Scotland where people go and volunteer to do um, observations, they get trained in how to do these observations and how to identify things and we've set up one at Kinghorn as well now, and we're hoping to get one along in the East Nuke fairly soon if we can um, and basically we're reporting what we see in our area. Um, whale Track is Hebridean Whale and Dolphin Trusts. Um, it's a phone app, so if you're out on the west coast and you see something, you can just switch your phone on and put that sighting into it. It picks up the position and everything. It's really clever app. So all these things are examples of citizen science where people are reporting what they are seeing. I will get to the fourth in a minute or two. Um, this is one of my little, uh, this is my granddaughter, she was about three but she'd been a, a humpback expert since about a year and a half and this is our shore watch site in Kinghorn looking down over the harbour. Um, fourth marine mammals um, happened, basically I met, I met um, this woman, I was introduced to this woman who, who had moved to Kinghorn and she set up fourth marine mammals with myself and a couple other people. Um, we set it up in 2017 because in that year in January we had the first long-term visit from humpback whales and uh, I think we set it up mainly because we'd 
we'd met uh, in August when I had spotted some sperm whales just sitting out from that harbour. A couple of sperm whales had moved in and I knew that she had good contacts, so I phoned her and we reported them all and we got involved in um, monitoring them while we were waiting on people to see if they required rescuing. In effect, what happened was they, they drifted out on the tide. One of them was ill. Sperm whales shouldn't be in the forth at all. One of them was ill, but we were actually sitting up there watching, looking down on the second sperm whale, lifting the other one up in the water so it could breathe. So we were quite uh, impressed by this whole scene so close into the shore. So when, when in January 2017, the humpbacks arrived, we set up Fourth Marine Mammals. We were already monitoring the dolphins on a smaller scale, but what we wanted to do was get people interested in the, fourth, the, mar the marine mammals of the fourth, the whales, the dolphins, the porpoises, and in the event that they required um, any kind of support, then we wanted to have an organisation where we could share information. But really the main thing was trying to get people to see them, because that's the first thing, get people excited about it. Um, now we have over, we've, well, in fact, we've had about 700 new members in the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's got quite out of hand now, the humpbacks are back again. Um, what, we, what we do, we have people reporting from right, right around at St Andrews all the way up the fourth and along the other side. Uh, and that means that if, say, the dolphins appear off of Anstruther, then somebody will post that, say what direction they're going, and you can be sitting at Pitt and Wien with your binoculars waiting on them passing or your camera. Um, so that's a, that is some of the purposes of the organisation. Um, Let's move on to the next one. So, I've just been um, talking to some uh, of Fife Council's tourist people today and uh, updating them on what, uh, what we actually see here and why it is useful for tourism. As I say, in 2017, we had humpbacks here. Uh, they had been spotted occasionally before um, and they'd been one or two had been stranded here before. Um, but now they've actually become regular visitors. In 2017, they stayed from early January and they were still here in March. So we were going out every day. They were quite predictable at that time. There was three of them, I think, at that, that year. Um, and you could tell people, go down to Harbour View at Kinghorn at two o'clock. And at one minute past two, a humpback would just jump out the water and it would go on for hours and then it would maybe drift out with the tide and then come back in the next day. <clears throat> so within, within a week or two of this, because obviously the media love uh, pictures of humpbacks jumping out of the water, as do mostly everybody. Um, so within a week or two, we were sitting with maybe two or three hundred people just sitting along the top of the path at Kinghorn or down at Petticoat Beach watching humpback whales. And I, I like, I'm like, I like talking to people. And I, I was meeting people that had come up from Dorset to see these whales. And there were people running minibuses up from Leeds, um, just for the day, just to come and see them. So it was a really, really popular um, event. And we've been lucky enough that uh, they have visited every year, every winter, I should say. Uh, since then. So that's five winters we've had humpback whales here. Last year, uh, last winter, they were not particularly visible. We got reports of a couple of uh, breaches. That's when they jump out the water. Um, and that was about it. They didn't hang around for very long, probably due to the fact that there, there may not have been a lot of fish in the fourth that year. Um, the year before that, we had one that got tangled up in creels. It may have arrived here already tangled up in creels and it subsequently died, washed up on the south shore of the Forth. But uh, the years before that, we were getting really good sightings. This year, we've had, the first report came in just over a month ago from a couple of people, uh, I think they were boat skippers uh, further out in the Forth and I'd been watching out there because I could see the gulls were feeding. Um, 
I got a phone call from one of the skippers of the boats in Granton saying that on his sonar, the fish were right up into the inner fourth at that point. So we started watching out and absolutely a couple a day or two later, we had humpback sightings. And that's about three weeks they've been here now. <coughs> Apart from a couple of days where the weather was too bad that we couldn't find them, they've been seen every day, um, which is extremely exciting. I was up this morning. Uh, every day we, let, we help people who have never seen a whale before to spot them. Um, a lot of children, a lot of people because of the uh, lockdown just now are, do, are homeschooling their children in Wales. Uh, so they're coming out and we, I think today, there's, um, even before I got out this morning, there was about four or five breaches um, reported. I was lucky enough to see one or two before I went off to pick up my grandkids. The, uh, the next one, the most, the most common visitor that we have is the bottlenose dolphin. I've got here, uh, they, they, they've been regular visitors since 1989 to me. Um, and that was in Kinghorn. I'm sure that up in the East Nook they were still visiting because we know they were in the Tay before that. Um, I sometimes um, have a chat with, uh, in fact, I did a joint talk recently with uh, Monica, who studies the dolphins from the Sea Mammal Research Unit at St Andrews. Uh, and they have records going back a bit further than that. <coughs> But we, um, I've been watching them since 1989, just over 30 years. And interestingly, the day after I saw my first dolphins in the fourth, I was going on holiday and I just stopped at the chip shop at North Keswick and the next thing the dolphins were just swimming past out there as well. So they've, um, they've been following me ever since then. Um, dolphins are much more active and uh, fun to watch, I think, than anybody else. At that point, I had a, a very small rowing boat that I used to go out in, and I could be out there among maybe a pod of 30 dolphins, and they'd be rolling over and slapping the boat, the bottom of the boat with their tails. Uh, I've had, I used to teach sailing in the bay at Kinghorn, and I've had kids out there that have actually been able to reach out and touch the dolphins as they swam alongside us. And um, they are a very sort of iconic uh, species, the dolphins. Uh, they are part of the uh, what they call, they now call, it used to be called the Murray Firth population, but they are, uh, they're known now as the East Coast population because they've spread the, in two ways, I think the population's increased, but they've also expanded their range and they're regularly seen down in the north east of England now and away up round uh, the north tip of, um, of Scotland. In fact, some of them have been reported uh, because they, they actually can identify them from their fin shape with all this, the scratches and nicks on the fins. Uh, they've been able to re uh, report that the dolphins that we are seeing here, sometimes it, they go off to visit uh, Holland and they've been right round to the west of Ireland as well. So they're very, very uh, fast traveling animals. Uh, they come up here they, they're not too predictable anymore. They used to be quite predictable and they would come up around the times of high tide. But uh, I think they prefer going into the tay for that because they get their, their salmon feeding in the tay much e more easily than in the fourth. Um, but they do uh, come along here regularly. At the end, nearer the end of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about, the, about numbers, about figures, how often we see them. At the moment, I'll just keep going through the species. These are, this is a minke whale, <coughs> which some, uh, sometimes looks a bit like a, a big dolphin, but uh, once you get used to seeing the two of them, uh, they move in very different ways. Uh, the, the minke whales are much more common out around the area from, let's say, Fife Ness, the May Island, uh, to the East Nuke. Um, again, it very much depends on where the fish that they're feeding on are. And, Last year, I think it was, or the year before, we had we actually had quite a lot of minke whales all the way up, and we were seeing them regularly. Um, they uh, they are a creature that I see quite often out on the west coast. The things that I see out on the west coast are minke whales and common dolphins. Not we we very rarely get common dolphins here, 
but I did um, have seen them here. So the minke whales are, you know, they're maybe 25, 30 feet long. Uh, if, they're, if they're fairly young, they can go much bigger than that. Same with the humpbacks. Uh, we tend to get the juvenile humpbacks here, um, or immature, but we have had them here with young before. And one, of, one that's fast becoming my favourite, although it's one of the most difficult to see, is the harbour porpoise. Um, they are only um, about, they're probably less than half the size of a, of, a, um, of a bottlenose dolphin. And by the way, we have the biggest bottlenose dolphins in the world here, um, mainly because they have to be big to withstand the cold. Uh, I was out in Mexico a couple of years ago and saw bottlenose dolphins and I was quite shocked at how small they were in comparison. But the, the porpoise is only maybe about a metre and a half long, um, four to five feet long. And uh, but they are very interesting little creatures. You, unlike the, the dolphin that you generally see a lot of the back and the fin coming out of the water, the porpoise, this is quite an unusual photograph. I think I took this in Tobermory Bay. But uh, normally you just see the fin and that's it. And it's a very sort of small triangular fin. Usually I only spot them on very calm days. Um, and I don't seem to see many of them in the winter, even when it is calm. Although there's been one or two reported over the last week. So maybe, maybe the porpoise spring is on the way. These are grey seals. Um, they're uh, quite common in the Forth. Um, unlike the common seal, which is becoming less common in the Forth. Uh, and nobody knows the answer to why yet. Uh, the grey seals... The grey seal population expands massively in the winter, although we don't tend to see them so much because they go out to the islands of the Forth and they, um, they have their pups and then they breed again. Um, I've, I've been helping to monitor the seal pups on Inchkeith Island uh, and this year and last year we had round about 900 pups born on the island. I know that I think the Isle of May does about two and a half thousand. The only real shore site that I know of around here is at St Abbs and they had quite a good population this year. So we have thousands and they come from all over the North Sea to breed and pup here. Um, so it's quite an important place. They don't stay around here. There's some quite fascinating work being done by St Andrews University Sea Mammal Research Unit, um, but that would be a bit complex for uh, going into just now. Um, but they, they range far and wide as well. Uh, so we only see a small number of them. The, the numbers of things that we are seeing in the fourth, that's a little table I, I prepared. Um, I, just started, uh, I just started actually keeping the numbers. I always kept the sightings, what we'd seen. I just started keeping the numbers uh, a couple of years back because someone asked me to do a talk for some scientists over in Edinburgh and uh, so I, I, I took my, all my figures and put them together so I've been doing that ever since keeping, uh, keeping records of what people are reporting uh, adding them all up at the end of the month or at the end of a couple of months and keep getting the, the total for the year and it, it makes quite interesting reading if you look at 2019 now I'll just explain to you a cetacean day <coughs> is a different figure. If you add up these figures, it does not add up uh, to what it says in the cetacean day column. And that is because sometimes we would see maybe a whale and a dolphin on the same day. But because we, we have a very limited scientific uh, ability because of the people who are reporting things, just the public are reporting these things to us, we haven't got enough data to make it um, absolutely spot on. So the figures we've got here are what the public have reported on our Facebook page. And the way that we justify this is we make it a minimum figure. This is a minimum figure. So in 2019, we had whales, dolphins or porpoises reported on our site for 179 days out of the year. Now that is a, an absolute minimum that they were around. In some days there was more than one thing uh, and more than one sighting. 
that means that almost every second day we're talking about there are whales, dolphins, or porpoises reported in the Forth. Now, we know that the porpoises are resident most of the year, um, but uh, without you know, actually recording them, we can't prove that. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do with these figures here. You can see that by far uh, the biggest number was the bottlenose dolphin. And interestingly, almost exactly the same for 2019 and 2020. Uh, that that is that is something that we would expect. They're they are they are very close. They stay very close to the coast through the summer, in particular. In the winter, they tend to go a little bit more offshore. Uh, Harbour porpoise uh, comes up next, and uh, interestingly, that year we had a lot of minke whales. Now I think I've said to you already that there was probably a lot of fish coming right up the fourth that year. Um, we had a good number of humpback whale reports as well. Um, some of them would be the beginning of 2019 and there was only a couple for the end because in, rather than coming in January that year, there was a couple of sightings in November. Um, so they'll be added together. Um, we get quite occasional um, interesting visitors. We get, we get things that people can't identify. That may just be due to their lack of knowledge. And as an organisation, we train people uh, on behalf of whale and dolphin conservation. We train them in identification and in how to observe them as well. Um, but we get things, we've had common dolphins in here. Um, we, the, I saw three of them only about five metres from the shore at Kinghorn Beach. And my thinking was that they were actually trying to stay away from the bottlenose dolphins, which are much bigger and much more aggressive. They were staying very close in while a big pod of uh, bottlenose dolphins um, swam past. Uh, so that was the only time I've seen the common dolphins. Um, and we get other things like northern bottlenose whale and uh, various sort of much rarer species, most of which shouldn't be here. There are many of them are deep water species uh, like the sperm whale, which even the North Sea isn't deep enough for them. They're, they haven't got food there. So they shouldn't be here. So what we find often is that these species either they don't hang around or we find them stranded or dead, um, which is tragic that they're already there's something something wrong with them. 2020, as I said, the bottlenose dolphins were quite a similar number. Uh, harbour porpoise were reasonable. That, the harbour porpoise figures are definitely all about how much calm weather we get. Um, Minke whale numbers were down. Most of the ones we got that year uh, in 2020 were re reported off the East Nuke. Uh, I don't think I saw any up this direction. And humpback whale in 2020, we only had one report of that. Um, and that was just before the end of the year there. Um, we have since, uh, I think my, I've got my figures sitting here. Uh, the latest figures we've had about 19 days of humpback whale sightings already this year. So it's going to be a good one. Uh, my feeling is that the, as long as the fish last, the whale will stay. And it has been reported that there are two whales around. Um, sometimes people are reporting them, but it's two boat skippers, two separate boat skippers that have reported seeing two whales from quite a close distance. Um, uh, myself and my daughter were watching one day and we were watching one and other people were shouting, there's, there's one over there and they were watching a completely different one. So I'm quite certain there have been two around, but at the moment, I think we're only seeing one. And the, the breaching, the breaching uh, of the whales is often used as a communication thing. If, if whales are a distance apart, they can use that big splat on the water to um, attract uh, either their young or their their buddies, whatever. You'll see that in 2020, the numbers were down a little bit. Um, that's probably partly to do with the less number of minke whales being reported and probably less fish in the fourth and the humpback whales. The whales were the, were the key to that and it's probably been due to not enough feeding for them to come in. Um, so we've got 135, which is still 
as I said, a minimum figure. Um, we don't know what's going up there at night. Um, we don't know uh, what's going up there in bad, bad weather when people are huddled inside. So these are, these are the figures that we have. Um, and we're keeping them going. So the benefits of citizen science are we, we have lots of people on the water. Um, in the days, what we have now, we do, we do not on Facebook, it's very, very easy for people to pass information on social media. Managing that is a different story. I've spent probably three to four hours every day in the last few weeks trying to manage all the posts that are going on and keep them well behaved and uh, make sure everybody gets answered. But it's all part of the the thing um, about engaging the public. I mean, when we're out doing our spotting, there are people walking by on the coastal path and we drag them over and come and look at this whale or come and see these dolphins. Um, the public are quite happy to be engaged in things like that. Um, not that many people, although they walk by the sea, actually look out to see um, enough uh, to see all the things for themselves. But when they're pointed out, uh, they, they become uh, very enthusiastic about it. Um, the other thing is we're, we're helping to provide data for science. And uh, we know um, because uh, we've been told that uh, the Sea Mammal Research Unit check out our page when they're doing their dolphin surveys just to see where the dolphins have headed that day. It saves them a lot of um, fuel for their outboard motors and it saves them a lot of time. Uh, so they, what they're doing is they're trying to get um, photographs of the dolphins' fins so that they can uh, set up an ID catalogue. Um, I'm trying to work just now at getting the, the data. There's, uh, somebody's wanting to help us go through our, our data on our site and make it more scientific or more usable by scientists. And that would be, that would be for me, that would be a, a great thing. I was uh, trained as a scientist, but I prefer to stay as an enthusiast at the moment and let other people do the statistical stuff. Um, but the main benefit, I think, of citizen science, apart from what the people get out of it, is the political power that you have. I think we've all seen uh, David Attenborough and seen how effective his uh, documentaries have been in getting people to know about climate change and global warming, things like that. Um, that power coming through the public is actually often more effective than coming through real science. Uh, and my sort of nirvana, if you want to call it that, is where people and scientists work together um, for the benefit of the wildlife. Now, my hope is that uh, if anything happens that we need, um, where we need the support of lots of people, on the fourth, we've got something like nearly 7,000 members we can reach out to right away um, and see what we can do to, to help uh, the animals. Um, it is a big, big important thing in the tourist business, I would say, for, for Fife, and it's something that we should cherish. Um, and, I think, and I think I'm on my last slide. Um, I couldn't see the time until then, so I'll make that maybe about half an hour or something that I've chatted for. I'm happy to chat now for as long as you like. <laughs> as long as, as long that's as... Brilliant, brilliant. Sorry? I said that's, that's brilliant, thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, so we've exited out of the share screen, so if everybody wants to make sure they're in gallery view again to be able to see as many people as possible. And... Uh, we'll, I'll try and manage the Q&A session, but you are split over two screens, so you'll have to bear with me if I don't see you waving immediately. There's not any questions in the chat box at the moment, so if you prefer to type a question into the chat box, you can, and I'll keep an eye on that as well. But has anybody got a question for Ronnie? <laughs> Christine, yes? Uh, would you like to say anything about the fact that you are supposed to report dolphins or seals etc which wash up or strand do you yeah. have anything to do with that yeah sure um i don't actually do it but we encourage uh, on our facebook page there's a list of all the numbers to report things to so basically if you if 
find a dead animal, you report it to SMA, SMAS, which is Marine Animal Stranding, something like that. Um, if you find a stranded animal, a stranded cetacean, let's say, um, the BD, BDMLR is the best uh, number to call, and that's, again, we have that on our, on our site. Um, for seals, you can either call BDMLR or the SSPCA, um, depending on who's not busy at the time. Um, yes, all these, all that information. I think we've actually even got an otter hotline now as well, um, as we've been getting a few otters spotted down, uh, down our way and reported. So, um, and somebody found, found one uh, recently. So we just stuck that number on. Even dead ones, people want to find out where they are, because that basically they've been alive uh, before. So it, it's like we've got all these numbers on our site. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, Christine. Someone else? Hey, Emily. Oh, sorry. Hi, hey, Ronnie. Yep, yeah, hi. So, long, long time I, I guess, no I know. <laughs> I, I guess I know Ronnie in a, a more professional capacity, so I'm going to take this opportunity to ask you a question when we're not in scientific meetings, but I was just wondering... Hey. Over your 30 years watching in the fourth, is there any sort of memory or sighting that really stands out as your uh, favourite moment? Uh, there's, I have hundreds of favourite moments um, and they vary for different reasons. You know, seeing the sperm whales was just incredible. Um, I had seen sperm whales uh, out in the Atlantic before, um, but... Uh, that was quite something to watch one hold, holding up another one to help it to breathe. Um, and I've, I've already spoken. That I, another moment which was incredible was just, I was teaching some kids to sail one day and it was really boring because it was very calm uh, and we weren't supposed to go out of the bay. And then some dolphins appeared just as I was about to take them in. And we, we went off sailing with dolphins all the way to Kirkcaldy and back. And half the pods turned round and came back uh, with us, which was incredible. And one, one of them had a baby. The half that stayed with the baby just kept going and the other half came back. They were so curious of what we were doing. But um, oh, I have hundreds of moments. I was telling somebody the other day about, uh, in fact, to the start of this was um, there was somebody out in a boat yesterday seeing the, the dolphins, uh, the, the humpback whale much closer than we could from on shore and I've, I've been very lucky and seen that very close up before and um, I've had whales come up beside my boat before um, but the one thing that I was a little bit jealous of was they were able to hear the sound of the breath of this whale and I remember a couple of years back my daughter who lives in the old house the house that I used to live in our old family house she actually recorded the whales breathing from her house one night. It was a really nice, calm night. Um, I haven't actually, I've heard it um, when I've been close up to them, but uh, never never while I've been in Kinghorn. The equivalent of that, I was down on my own in Petticar Car Park one morning, a really grey, misty morning, and a whole pod of dolphins came into the bay and just got, went round, it kept going round in a big circle you could hear every one of their, their breaths. And I actually had to go out and haul a group of women joggers over to see it because there's nobody else there to witness it for me. So that's a very small selection, Emily. We, you know that we could, uh, in fact, we will do this when we're allowed to do this together. We need to go and have a, just a, a good chat about all these little stories. Because as you say, we spend a lot of time talking in the scientific forum, but uh, which is not my favourite place, but... Uh, the, what the mean the the end justify the means don't they <laughs> so yeah that's a small selection um, lots more where that came from yeah. we've got a few questions coming in on the chat now okay. JD is asking says maybe a silly question but do you need good binoculars to see the animals if so do you have any recommendations she says um, I live right by the sea and have occasionally seen dolphins um, uh, there's no such thing as a silly question um, we um, have 
being able to watch the whale, even though it's a mile and a half out, we could be able to see the spout without binoculars. And sometimes it's actually easier to spot things without binoculars because you can see a much wider view. Um, as far as recommending binoculars, um, for the last two years, I've been recommending these wonderful little binoculars that I have a, a pair of. Um, I'm currently down to three pairs of binoculars, but uh, the, the ones I was using were called Bushnell Trophies, but the, the, ever since Brexit happened, they've gone from, they've gone, they've been on sale for something like two years down at 70, 80 pounds, and they've just jumped up to 185. I don't recommend them anymore. Um, for our shore watch, we use um, Opticron binoculars, um, sorry, I think I missed a bit out. The ones that, I'm, that I was using that I was telling you about are 8 by 42s which is more than enough magnification. Um, they are quite good. The ones that we use for our shore watch uh, site are from Opticron, and they are 7 by 50s Now, there's a slightly less magnification, but what you do is you get a much wider view um, with the 50 part um, and you get a lot of light in as well so they pick things up really well. Uh, these Opticron ones they're about 100 well one of the guys that I know um, a guy called Steve Trulock that um, organizes a, a thing called Orca Watch he is a, an agent for Opticron and he's selling them cheaper than Opticron themselves and he was giving us a deal if we were a shore watch volunteer um, but they're about £180 and they are excellent. They, you don't actually have to focus them. They've got individual focus on your eyepieces in case you've got differences in your eyes. Once they're set up, they're kind of they're pretty much well focused from 50 metres to infinity. And that saves an awful lot of eye strain so you can look through them for a long time. They're a bit heavier um, than uh, the other binoculars that I have. They've got a compass built into them, which is great for if you're trying to tell people which way to look. Um, they, what I recommend if you're going to spend any time is you get a little monopod, like a, a telescopic stick that screws into your binoculars. Uh, we were watching, the first year the humpbacks were here, we were out sometimes 12 hours a day watching them. And we were wondering why our shoulders and arms were sore at the end of the day. So I just got, got myself one of these monopods and a little mount that screws into the front of your binoculars. So these are a couple of my recommendations, but really um, ask around. The secret is never get anything that, if you divide the first number into the second number, never get anything that doesn't give you at least four. So eight by 32s are just okay, right? But eight by 40s are better. Um, seven by 50s, despite not being quite as big a magnification as the ones that I'm using preferentially at the moment, because I get a much wider field of view, which is great for a, um, something like humpback whales that can appear hundreds of yards away from where you saw them the last time, or even half a mile away or more. So there, there are endless, endless numbers. There was a chat about it on our Facebook page today. Um, I tried to stay out of it. <laughs> So yeah, a little bit of information. And I don't get paid by anybody to say that. <laughs> Next question excited. I've got here is from Fiona. Can you talk a bit more about the difference between the grey and harbour seals and why the harbour seals are disappearing? Um, I could talk a little bit about it. I'm not a, an expert in seals. The, the grey seals, the, 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 there's a couple of ways to tell the difference. And I, I actually, I go out and monitor the pupping and I still can get mixed up when you're away from the pupping site. Um, harbour seals tend to be smaller. Um, they've got a much more sort of uh, cute face, let's call it. Um, the the grey seals have a bit, uh, particularly in the males, and you have to think there's quite a bit of variation over male, female, and harbour seal and grey seal. The males tend to have a very straight nose. Um, you know, so they're looking right down a, a, a straight due to their nostrils. Um, whereas the, the harbour seals have got like a rounded head with a little cute nose on the end. Um, you see that, that I'm doing this in very scientific terms. So uh, there are, there's also one of them, 
uh, which has so like sort of straight up and down slits for nostrils, and the other one's kind of off off at an angle. And I've completely forgotten which is which, and I'm not going to, so I'm not going to say which which uh, which one it is. I would know when I saw it though. <laughs> um, why they are reducing in numbers is still a big part of a scientific investigation. I don't think anybody knows exactly why they're, they're reducing in numbers in our area and up the East Coast, if I'm right. I'm sure Emily will know more about this than, than me, but uh, we still haven't worked out what it is. There certainly um, seems to be, the same, they don't seem to be keen, the harbour seals don't seem to be keen on grey seals. We know, and um, we witnessed a couple, of, a couple of winters back, we actually witnessed five episodes of cannibalism in one month, just on, and that's off of Kinghorn alone. We actually saw the adult grey male swimming up behind, and it was a grey seal pup, and swam right up behind it and basically bit its head off and then proceeded to eat it for the next couple of hours just right in front of us in the water. Now that, that alone, the cannibalism side of things is, is relatively new to scientists. I think it was seen the first time out on the Isle of May, I think, a number of years back. But until then, they thought that they were getting caught up in propellers of boats because um, it had a similar effect or what they thought was a similar effect. So I would say there's a bit of pressure from grey seals on our harbour seals, um, but I honestly don't know a lot more than that. So I'm not really willing to say any more. Okay. Um, next question here from Joe. Do the humpback whales come in at high tide? Well, they are... Humpback whales can handle very shallow water. They, they'll come in to, to really shallow water and feed. Um, there was there's some video of humpback whales a couple of years ago, and I'm pretty sure it was the whale we, we saw in the middle of August, which is a really unusual time for us. And um, we saw two days later, there was a humpback whale moved into St. Cyrus up the coast and stayed for a couple of weeks. And there was a wonderful video of it coming into right into the beach and feeding. Um, so that, that's the first thing. It doesn't matter to a humpback whale whether the tide's in or out. When they came in 2017, they spent a lot of their time, like at Kinghorn, the, the fourth starts to narrow a little bit, and uh, they spent a lot of their time out in the shipping channel, further out. Um, and they would come in with the high tide, and they would hang around off Kinghorn for a while. And then... They started coming in and they'd be at Kinghorn at the low tide and they've gone all the way up to the bridges um, with the tide. Yesterday I was sitting watching because I told people to meet me down at Petkar and uh, at the low tide and they just, they went off against the, they went off against the tide. The tide was still going out and they were away up by Inchcombe. So it's a, it is not something that you can predict. Um, and back in 2017, we were able to predict to the minute when we would get them breached almost. Um, and since then, we've, uh, we've had that theory thrown out the window. So today, I actually, I watched one. Uh, I went to Burnt Island to watch this morning because I was heading through there for something. And uh, I actually, actually watched one come right into the sandbank that's between Kinghorn and Burnt Island and swim along the side bank on the inside of what we call the Blay Rock. It's a great big rock, uh, which is on the edge of the shipping channel. And it just circled right round. And I've ne I've ne I'd never seen it in that close before. Um, so, as I say, they're, they're quite comfortable. And I think once they get to know a water, that, that answer leads on to the, the next question from Jane, who lives in North Queensbury. She's yep. keen to know how far up the fourth these ama amazing creatures come. She's seen plenty of seals, but not dolphins or whales. Yeah. Well, at North Queensbury, you have got a fantastic spotting uh, place at Carling Nose Point. Uh, set up on these cliffs for the next few weeks and uh, don't go away. You'll see them. They have been going right up. Uh, 
certainly beyond Inchcombe, uh, and we can we can still see them from Kinghorn um, when they're up at uh, Inchcombe, and uh, they've been up a long way. And I know that there's been a few people from Dalgetty Bay asking the same questions, and they've all been out and seen it. Um, it very much depends on when they go up, whether whether they go up there and it's light or whether it's dark. Um, but the, the secret is just what, well, really, you need to go on our, our Facebook page and uh, just see where it's progressing. Learn, learn the boy numbers, that's the best way. We've, we've got a map on our Facebook page of all the boy numbers of the shipping channel, and we tend to refer to them um, when they get a bit far, far away. So they certainly have, they certainly, I'm not aware that they've gone under the bridges, but they've been up very close to the bridges. Super. Got a question here from Elizabeth, who's new to Fife and was previously in Aberdeenshire, where mm -hmm. she saw harbour dolphins, grey seals, and orca pods. Do the orcas ever come down to the fourth? Uh -huh. uh, we know that orcas have been in the fourth, and they've been right up to the bridges. There were a few years back. They were they were getting spotted by the guys working on the bridges regularly, um, over a short period of time, uh, and so we know that they they visited. I have never seen one in the fourth myself, um, so I wouldn't hold your breath for that. But uh, they they definitely come here, and you would hope that with all these seals going about, we'd get a bit a few more visits from them. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Definitely attract them. <laughs> Sorry, I missed a bit of that. Yes, the seals definitely attract them. I think there's much more. There's so many more seals at uh, Newbury and Aberdeenshire. And uh, yeah, orcas are just in that element there. Yeah, I think um, yeah, you've got two different kinds of orcas. Some of them feed uh, on seals and porpoises. And some, somebody sent me an amazing photograph today of a porpoise just getting caught by, a, uh, by an orca. And some of the orcas just feed on fish. Um, but I would imagine the ones that are cruising all the way down here are probably looking for seals. Um, but they don't tend to hang about long. Um, and, but I think that's that same um, quite typical of, of them. Again, Emily will know a lot more about her because she's a rather obsessive orca fan. So, but we've yeah, got, uh, sorry, carry on, Robbie. Yeah, definitely, we've had visits. Um, well, a kind of related question here from Daryl: Do you get pilot or beluga whales in the four? Um, I've I've never heard of a beluga. Um, uh, been in the fourth, certainly pilot whales, because there was a big stranding up your way. I think it was Ely or Earls Ferry or thereabouts uh, a few years back, and they managed to get some of them back in the water, but uh, some of them did die. So pilot whales are spotted every now and again, and again, that's another species that shouldn't really be in here. They're quite deep diving um, whales, um, but they do come in and, and they do strand here. Yeah. Yeah, Eileen's actually come on to the chat and said about the stranding in yeah. 2012. Yeah, well, actually, um, I've never seen a pilot whale in the fourth, but I missed them by five minutes, and that was at North Queen's Ferry, interestingly enough. A friend of mine was coming over in the train and saw them at North Queen's Ferry, and uh, rather than phoning me and getting me to meet them there, he came home and said, do you fancy going to see these pilot whales? And by the time we got there, we missed them by five minutes. So. But these ones did not strand. There was another standing up at Curis as well. So it's quite, truly, really, it's quite bad news if you see pilot whales in the fourth. Yeah. Another yeah. question there from Elizabeth was, what whale watch app do you use or recommend? What whale watch app do I use? Um, <laughs> when I'm on the West Coast, I use um, whale track and um, it's excellent it's i am a technophobe and even i can work that using my phone um, so when i'm out of my boat i use whale track for the hebridean whale and dolphin trust when i'm here we have a shore watch point and um, they have not got an app but they have got a you can report your sightings to them um, you have to know where you are you have to know uh, what you're seeing, but you can post on their um, their site. That's the Shore Watch site, and the other one I report my um, sightings. So I tend to just I tend to do more 
of my whale sight, my whale sightings, the humpback sightings, to Sea Watch as well. Um, so a friend of mine's a director of Sea Watch, so I like to keep in with them. Um, so uh, they have just brought out an app. But I haven't even been able to get it on my phone yet. Not had time to do that. But again, you can actually just go onto their website and report your sighting there. So what it's always worth going. At, it's actually worth going in to these. Um, websites and looking to see what information it is that they ask you um, so that you you know when you're out there to what to what to look for and often they're saying where did you see it and you have to give a grid reference well you can go in uh, and google grid reference finder and you can just you can right click on the map where you think you saw it and it gives you all that information so you don't you don't actually have to know these things you don't have to be clever and use map use real maps and things like that and compass bearings. So, yeah. So the whale, the whale track app is amazing if you're over on the West Coast. The Sea Watch app has just come out and I, I don't know a lot about it yet. I know that there, are, there is interest in bringing out more apps for the East Coast, um, but when it happens, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> So a question here from Elizabeth Rich is, how particular are dolphins and porpoises about the type of fish they eat? Uh, I've never asked them. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my thinking is that uh, they, they prefer salmon. I'm pretty sure that salmon is the top of their list um, because it's a very high, um, nu high nutri nutritious, highly nutritious food for them. But I'm also pretty certain that they're feeding on mackerel when they come up the fourth in the summer as well. Uh, Kinghorn is a really good spot for uh, mackerel fishing, and uh, we watch the we watch the uh, the dolphins feeding on them. But the fourth has actually got a re pretty fair amount of salmon going up it as well. So I would imagine they will preferentially eat a salmon. But if there's, there's sort of thousands of mackerel around them. Make sure they're not going to turn their nose up at Super. That's my unexpert view. <laughs> Excellent. I'm just scrolling through, you've got lots of people saying thanks very much for a very informative talk, incredibly interesting. Um, got another question here. Do any of the mammals get tagged or followed by sonar? No, we were talking about that somewhere. Oh, I was, I was on a Zoom thing last night. Um, we don't tend to tag cetaceans over here. Uh, it's, uh, well, what, what I was getting told last night was that there are places like Norway, some people in Norway are doing it. It's a very intrusive thing. It's basically stick a barb, a barb dart in them and uh, animals have actually died from um, infection from these things. So. We don't tend to do that. What, what they do to track them here is they take photographs. Um, for the dolphins, it's the dorsal fin and the shape and if there's any little nicks out of it. Um, for orcas, they've got a specific like pattern, but there are, like the most famous orca of all has got a great big triangular nick out of his dorsal fin. Um, humpback whales have got unique tail patterns so you can compare uh, you can compare the tail flukes they call them um, and see what the pattern is and there's been some really interesting discoveries uh, in the fourth um, there's a young woman called Lindsay McNeil whose job is as a hairdresser but she has a, an incredible memory for pictures of humpback tails and she is a uh, she has identified some uh, and she's found out that they've actually been in where they've been. They've been matched into Iceland or out in the Caribbean where they, they breed. Um, and just recently there was a match between uh, one that was seen on the West Coast um, and is sitting off a of petica right now. Uh, my favourite bit of that story is that the guy who was out, had the boat out on the West Coast used to live 300 yards up from the car park at Petticur, so um, he's an old, uh, not such an old, he's actually a friend of my 
more a friend of my kids, but uh, although I've become more of a friend of his now. <laughs> so, so that's how that's how they they can track them, um, rather than using um, using the, the the sort of tracking devices. Um, that's been done a lot on Baskin sharks. That's when I was involved in the Baskin shark research. We were helping uh, people from Exeter University locate Baskin sharks, and they would come out if it was calm days, and they would come along and tag through the through the fin. That's not quite as easy to do on a, a dolphin or a humpback. So, yeah, I think it's done other places. So. <laughs> Got another comment here from Daryl. The, the dolphins drive the mackerel to the surface in a bait ball, which gannets take advantage of, which leads to a feeding frenzy. Uh, that, that happens all over the, the world. Um, dolphins uh, herd up um, fish, yeah, and the gannets, they push them to the surface and then the gannets can feed on them as well, yeah. Yeah, I've seen them, um, well, I've seen it here. I've seen it here, and the dolphins just go in it. Um, and occasionally we get big aggregations of gannets coming in with it. But uh, I saw it once off the coast of Portugal, um, and it was like the biggest feeding frenzy I've ever seen in my life. It was probably about the size of um, 10 or 20 football pitches full of dolphins, giant tuna, um, small tuna, sardines, gannets, everything. It was just an incredible sight. Um, but uh, yeah, it happens here on a smaller scale. Super. Right, I think we've exhausted the questions in the chat at the moment. There's lots of positive comments, so we'll make sure they get copied and emailed across to you. Lots of people saying how interesting it's been. Thank you. Just leave yeah. that open in case anybody wants to post anything else. But are there any questions in the room, so to speak? If anybody wants to wave get my attention. Just to finish off the last one, the <laughs> most, uh, my favourite bait ball ever, because I've seen these from my boats on the west coast, and it is incredibly tight when they, they come together. And one day I was sailing up from Col, and I just phoned a friend of mine who drives the little ferry over to Mark and Egg, to see if he ask if he'd seen anything because I'd seen him crossing further north, and uh, he hadn't seen anything. I hadn't seen anything in all the miles that I'd sailed that morning, and just as he put the phone down, I saw that this the water rippling um, about oh, two hundred yards away. I couldn't work out what it was, and I thought it's probably just small fish. And I sailed across, and it was actually bubbles coming up out of the water. And the next thing all these little fish started jumping out of it and I looked down over the side and right down below me was a big minky whale just coming up underneath us. <laughs> it came up about 50 yards away in the end, but oh, so spectacular. And, and I, I mean, I've, I've asked people about this and if em Emily's listening in, there's, we don't need to talk about it, but uh, it, to me, it was like a primitive form of bubble netting, which is what the humpback whales do. They, they go around in a circle and they release their breath and it makes like a big net, and that's what closes the fish into a, a manageable portion, let's call it. So, yeah. So that's uh, that was my bait ball experience. Super. Any more questions? Yeah. Check the other page. I'm not seeing anyone. Right. We leave now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> If that's the end of the questions, I'm going to suggest that everybody unmutes themselves so that we can thank Ronnie with a great big round of applause. But uh -huh. then we'll stay in the meeting if anyone wants to chat a little bit longer. So thank you very much, Ronnie. That was really, really interesting. Oh, you're yeah. very welcome. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank, thank you for inviting me. And